The date is Saturday, April 26. This will be a webinar dealing with questions that were submitted by people attending the webinar. And let's just go from there. So first question I received was wondering about my thoughts on Apple long term and post split. So Apple announced this week with their earnings report. a seven to one split and it is to take effect in June so the first thing to know is that that doesn't change the value of the company it'll have the exact same market cap when it closes in June and they do the split it'll just have seven times more shares outstanding you know personally with Apple to me I don't really think the split is a huge deal. I think it's all about products with Apple. The market has given Apple about a two-year pass on you know not releasing any major advancements with their iPhone or a new device such as the iPad and after the split and going into this fall I think the market is really expecting Apple to come out with either a better iPhone something different there or a wearable technology device such as this iWatch you hear getting thrown out or possibly even you know a TV but bottom line they need to come with something I can tell you right now the market expects Apple to have something up its sleeve so if Apple doesn't deliver that over the next six months really then you're gonna see the stock go down it doesn't matter if it's going down from five hundred and seventy dollars where it is now or if it's going down from seventy six dollars when it splits bottom line you don't get products you don't get something that excites the market then the stock is gonna go down if Apple had just announced their earnings without the split you would not have seen the stock make a huge jump the split is a catalyst for now and it's a catalyst between now and Jan and Jan June but after it comes and goes then you know the lower stock price itself is not a catalyst in my opinion because there will be so many more shares outstanding and it's really kinda gonna be similar to Microsoft in the way it trades so I expect it to be a slower mover you know if you just look at Apple on Friday the stock traded with a low 564 and a high of 572 that's an eight dollar range that's an eight dollar range for traders to play however post split that would translate to a dollar and fifteen cent range granted the percentage movement will stay the same but the dollar movement is going to contract and that's not very good from a trading perspective you know if you take a stock at ten dollars every ten cents is one percent right if you take Apple at 570 every five dollars and seventy cents is one percent now both of these are one percent moves but when you talk about traders and you know the amount of money if you just say each one cent is one unit okay which would you rather be able to play would you rather be able to choose from a ten cent window to buy and sell and make 1% or would you rather choose from a $5.70 window to buy and sell and be able to make that same 1%? For me, I would rather play from the $5.70 window as opposed to the 10 cent window or what is going to be, you know, at 75 bucks every 75 cents would be 1%. So I don't think it's great from a trading perspective, but as far as just, you know, my thoughts, bottom line, post-split Apple long term, all about products. The split doesn't sway me either way. I'm not saying Apple is a buy because they're doing a split. Apple is a sell because they're doing a split. That is really irrelevant to me. It's all about products. Next question I received was how do I decide which strike price to buy this is dealing with options do I choose to strike the night before or usually during the trading day also does the day of the week affect which 
strike price I choose? This is a good question. And the simple answer is that I play a strike that I believe can go in the money. The best scenario in options trading is buying an out of the money strike and then having it go in the money. That is the goal. That's what's going to lead to the greatest percentage return is if you're out of the money, but then the stock price moves in such a way that now puts you in the money. So the first thing I think about before I choose any strike is do I think the stock can realistically get to that price? So I'll just show you here with Tesla, for instance, going into this week, I'm watching the Tesla 190 puts. Why? Well, Tesla closed at 199. I think it's very realistic Tesla can go to 190 on Monday. That would only be a drop of, you know, four four and a half percent. The stock dropped four percent on Friday alone. So if you can just do that same thing on Monday, these are going to be in the money. That's going to be a nice return. On the call side, I'm looking to play the 205 calls. Same thing. I think those 205 calls can go in the money on Monday. Looking at Netflix, I'm looking at the 300 strike puts on Netflix. Netflix closed at 320. This is a stock in a terrible downtrend, lost 7% on Friday alone. I think Netflix can go to 300. I really do. So that's the strikes I'm playing. Now on a bounce attempt, you know, I'm watching the 335 calls. I think Netflix can get towards 335. And it's just the same thing across the board. Amazon, I'm watching the 295 puts because I think that's where Amazon can get to. And even below, I'm watching the 30750 calls because I think that's where Amazon can get to. It is subjective, though. I, I saw a, you know, somebody asking about my answer to this. You know, I'm giving my best answers being the person that got asked the questions for these webinars. You ask this question to somebody else, they'll give you a different answer most likely. So to the point about buying deep in the money to capitalize on higher delta, it's going to cost a lot more in principle. That's not something I like doing personally. And if it goes against you, that higher delta is going to work against you on the loss side, just like it would work for you on the profit side. So personally, myself, you know, I like I like playing an out of the money strike that I believe can go in the money, and that is really how I determine all of my strikes. Now, as for does the day of the week affect which strike I choose? Yes, it does, because on Monday I've got five days to let my belief play out. However, on Friday, you know, let's just pretend it's Friday. If by Friday Tesla is still at 200 and it hasn't made any attempt lower, I'm not still going to be watching the 190 puts. Why? Because Tesla hasn't showed me any ability to get down towards 190 all week, so I probably don't believe at that point that it can still go to 190. So I would likely adjust higher to the 197.50 puts. Or if it hasn't moved towards 205 all week, it's still hanging around 200. I'm going to adjust lower to maybe now play the in the money 200 strike calls. If as the week progresses, the stock isn't showing good movement that is getting a good reaction from the out of the money strikes, well, premium's going to come down so I can go closer to the money, maybe even in the money, without premium being very high because of the fact that volatility will have decreased, so implied volatility will have decreased, and the cost of premium itself will have decreased. Next question deals with penny stocks and what my opinion is of the marijuana weed stocks in the penny market right now. And what I'll say to that is, bottom line, these weed stocks will be in play on and off for the, for, for the foreseeable future, barring something crazy. But there's a few factors that will impact whether these stocks have staying power over the long term or if they just fade off into the oblivion 
like most penny stocks do. You'll, you'll recall if you've been playing penny stocks for a few years, the penny market is very cyclical and it is very trend oriented. Sometimes it's going, sometimes it's gold stocks that are hot. I remember in 2011 when gold was going from $1,000 to $2,000 an ounce, all the gold penny stocks were super hot. Then it was lithium stocks, or maybe that was before the gold stocks, I don't remember. But then I remember LEXG was a huge promo, went from a dollar to ten dollars. And then lithium stocks were super hot. All right. Now gold penny stocks and lithium penny stocks are super illiquid. There's no momentum there at all. They, you know, we're just your typical penny stock pump and dumps once once the broader underlying themes played out. It's the same situation here. The broader underlying theme that's driving these marijuana stocks is the fact that state governments are starting to approve marijuana legally. They're decriminalizing it. If you don't understand that that's the only reason these stocks have started to go higher, then that's a problem. You need to recognize that right away. So with that said, the factors that will impact what these stocks do you know, over the next few months and years is, number one, does the federal government itself, does Washington, D.C. ever come out and take a stance on marijuana laws? And if so, what is that stance? So far, D.C. has been pretty quiet, as far as I know, you know, about really where they're at on this marijuana stuff going on, you know, in Colorado and Washington State and what have you. So the federal government could drop all these stocks in a second if they just were to tell states, no, this is a federal crime to smoke or distribute or sell medical marijuana, it doesn't matter, blah, 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 and all, the, all these stocks, you know, go away. Now, as long as the federal government stays, stays quiet, then it's just really up to what the states continue to do. So do more and more states legalize pot? and that would be a bullish catalyst. So assuming more and more states continue to legalize pot and assuming the federal government doesn't come in and say that you know the states can't be making these decisions, then it's just a matter of at some point do these weed companies actually make money legitimately with audited financials to prove it? Until we know the answer to that question, the weed sector as a whole will just remain purely speculative and go through a lot of hot and cold periods. Right now we're in a very cold period. You know, you saw with PHOT getting halted that that market has completely dried up. And I could go across the board here and show you. the downtrends going on ever since PHOT got halted. Okay, you look at ERBB, it's gone from 10 cents to 4 cents. LATF has gone from over a penny to cut in half. GRNH has gone from 70 cents to 30 cents. All right, so Right now, it's a cold market because it's just still purely speculative. There's nothing fundamental from the companies yet. We haven't seen, at least I haven't seen, audited financials really showing real dollar income and real growth. And the one company that people thought did have that just happened to be PHOT. And the SEC said, no, 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 no. We don't trust you. Let's halt you, and the stock was down 57%, which isn't a good look. So we need to have another company like PHOT that the SEC doesn't, you know, come down on. So until that happens, it's just going to be pumps and dumps. You look at the beginning of the year, we had pumps. Now, since about March, really, since PHOT put its top in in mid-March, 
you have had dumps across the board. Again, obviously PHOT, but the other another really hot one was ERBB, which you look nice pump beginning of the year. Oh, look what happened in the middle of the March, right when PHOT got halted, dump. Okay, and these stocks are trying to find their footing maybe, but you know, right now it's a cold spell. However, what I will say is you want to be buying and holding these penny stocks if that's your style when they're cold. You know, these are when they put in bottoms and they go through long periods of consolidation, but the risk is that you're catching a falling knife. However, the reward is that when they wake back up, you know, you see what ERBB did. You saw what PHOT did. You saw what GRNH did. So as far as my opinion on the marijuana stocks right here, right now, it's that they are not in play because they're not hot. There's no juice flowing through them, but they'll come back in play at some point, probably in the not so distant future, and they'll give a good bump up. But that bump up probably won't be sustainable, like I said, until there's something truly fundamental to support all of the hype because Colorado decriminalizing pot doesn't mean that penny stock XYZ is making money. That's not the way it works and that's not the way markets work. Next question. How do you set up trading as a business? Now, I don't have a ton of experience with this myself as I just trade as an individual, but when I did research it, it seemed to be that the way you would want to do it is to register an LLC and establish yourself as 100% manager of that LLC and register all of your trading accounts under your business. So if you go to sign up with a broker like E-Trade or TradeStation or TD Ameritrade, then you want to make sure you're not setting it up. You don't hit the individual box, you hit the as a business box option that they have. Okay, and the benefit of setting your trading up as a business, at least the ones that I for sure know about, is that you can write off a lot of expenses, such as computer equipment. I just bought three brand new monitors, I just bought a brand new computer, $2,000, that is a write-off against capital gains if you're trading as a business. Or you can also write off platform subscription fees. I get charged 100 bucks a month for some of the uh, data that I'm getting from TradeStation. And I can write that off. You can also write off website subscription costs. For instance, people who are trading as a business that are subscribed to my premium website paying 130 bucks a month they can write the cost of their subscription off. You can write off your internet. You need streaming internet to get your quotes. You could write off a new desk. You know, there's lots of write-offs. Now, what I don't know, so I can't offer the answer on, is how you can write off losses as a business. I know that as an individual, I can claim losses of up to $3,000 versus my gain. So for example, if I lost $10,000 last year and made $10,000 this year, I could carry forward $3,000 worth of last year's loss so that I only actually made $7,000 in taxable gains this year. But again, that's as an individual. I do not know the legality behind you know, what your losses look like if you are registered as a business. But I did find a link, a pretty good link. I just posted it into the chat room. But my best advice would be to consult a tax professional. And on top of that, okay, you want to spend the $100 consultation fee to talk to a tax professional. I know a lot of people over the years that they've said, man, I'm not going to spend the money on an accountant. I'm just going to Google. Well, guys, Google doesn't know everything. People that went to school for this shit and they studied it and they make it their business, they know everything. So spend some money, okay, because 
the hundred dollars or two hundred dollars you pay to talk to somebody that actually knows what they're doing will be a lot less than the penalties you pay when the IRS finds you because you did something wrong because you didn't actually follow the right laws. So consult a tax professional and don't be a cheap ass when it comes to consulting a tax professional. Next question I received. How do I know when to enter and exit a trade? Now, this is the holy grail of trading and you know I can't really answer it in a webinar setting like this. This is something that comes with tons of experience or dedicated learning. You know, if I was to spend time with you every single day, week after week, and show you tons of different scenarios and examples and say, hey, you see what I did there, you see what I did there, you see why I did that, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I could give you a, a really good answer over a period of time. But I'll still do my best to you know, give you an answer here in this webinar, but just understand that it is difficult. But it, it's a great question, so I, I didn't want to not discuss it. Now, the first aspect of this question, what it really comes down to is your prep work. You have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. The market is open from 9.30 Eastern to 4 p.m. Eastern. I put in more work after hours than I do when the market's open. Just like players get better in the off season, traders have to do their best trades when the market's closed. So I'll show you some of the prep work that I do to help answer this question and I'll show you some subsequent charts because if you're prepared you know what you're you know what you're watching for first and then from that preparation if what you're watching for shows up you already know how you're going to act and then you can execute based on that preparation and then measure the results if the results are positive then you know you're executing properly and know when to enter and exit if the results are negative then you might not be identifying setups properly I just want to show you some examples of prep work and then show you how I knew when to enter these particular trades. So you're looking at a watch list I compiled for Friday that I posted on my site and I do this for every single day. So I did this on Thursday after the market was closed. I prepare for the following trading day with a paragraph outlook on the stock, an immediate term outlook. So here's my outlook on Google going into Friday. And you can see one of the things I said was that it was very important for Google to stay below 540 if it's a clean short. The best case scenario is Google staying below 535. And then I remarked that if that happens, I'm looking for a 530 breakdown. And if you break 530, I'm thinking Google trends towards 500 with support at 525 and 510. So from this, I would say, in my head, what I'm saying is, all right, when Google opens up, here's what I'm watching. Number one, does it stay below 535? If it stays below 535, I'm targeting a 530 test. Number two, if it breaks down at 530, my first targeted support is 525. So how do I know to enter? Well, if it stays below 535, I'm going to know that based on my prep, that is an entry for a short trade. How do I know when to exit? Well, if it breaks down at 530 and gets down towards 525, I know that that was a support test. That's a targeted support area. So I'm going to look to take profits there. That's those are my two criteria. So let's just look at Google's intraday chart from Friday. I want to point out a couple things here. Number one, look at where the stock opened. It opened okay right around here where I'm circling. That was south of 
534. So I said 535 was the key. So we for sure stayed below 534 and 535, even better. As long as we stay below 535, I was looking for a test of 530. 530s right down here. You can see that Google moved down to 530 right around 10 o'clock. And then if it breaks down at 530, I'm looking for a move down to 525. 525 is this line here. And you can see that as Google came below 530, it then downtrended to that 525 level and then pretty much stayed around 525 for a good chunk of the day. So being prepared on Google gave me, I knew the setup that I was looking to trade. And once I saw that setup playing out, I was able to trade it accordingly. Let's look at another example. Again, prep work. Price line. Price line going into Friday to me looked like it was just channeling between 1200 and 1235. And I said something's got to give in either direction in order, in order to get aggressive. If it breaks down at 1200, then I'm targeting 1180 to 1150. If it breaks out at 1235, then I'm targeting 1255 to 1275. Well, let's look at Priceline intraday on Friday. All right, so right away I've got two key numbers. I said 1,200 and 1,235. Well, stock gaps down right here, so I'm closer to that 1,200 level right off the bat, and I'm watching what goes on at 1,200, right? Well, you can see Priceline loses 1,200 ahead of 10 o'clock, so in my head, my prep work has told me if it loses 1,200, it's going to 1,180 to 1,150. What do you have? You lose 1,200, then you can't get above it. Boom, 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 boom. Right down to that 1,180 mark, okay? You stalled out, went sideways for a little bit at 1,180, right? But then, where does Priceline end up going? Later on in the day, even lower comes into the 1150s. I know that I'm exiting because I'm approaching targets on the way down. So I knew to enter because my prep, my prep work told me to enter. My prep work said if Priceline loses 1200, then that's bearish and it's going to 1180 to 1150. All right, so it starts with your prep. After your prep work, it comes down to becoming familiar. It uh, comes down to being familiar with charts and level two and time and sales movement. But again, that's really not something I could dive into here. That's something I, I need to show you. And I do have some examples that I'll show with the next question that will maybe help reinforce this answer as well. Now, the other aspect of this question that I wanted to cover is your comfort level. You need to be comfortable in order to know anything. How do I know when to enter or exit a trade? Well, it's because when I get in the trade, I'm comfortable doing so. I'm comfortable that if price line breaks below 1200, it's going to continue lower. And if it starts holding 1200 after breaking below it, then that's not my setup. So that would make me uncomfortable, so I would get out. I used to think, and some of you, I guarantee, probably feel this way, that it is okay to feel nervous in a trade, that when you enter a trade and those little butterflies in your stomach that pop up right away, that's okay. That's a part of trading. That's the way it's supposed to be. No, it's not the way it's supposed to be. You're always supposed to feel comfortable. Because if you feel comfortable, that means you're prepared properly. That means you're confident in your ability to execute. If you did not do one of those two things, or you don't have one of those two things, then you can't possibly be comfortable. And over the long term, the trade is not going to work out. Do you think Michael Jordan was nervous sitting at the free throw line with the game on the line? No, he wasn't. All right? He was never going to the free throw line uncomfortable with the position he was in.
And just to touch on that further, people experience big losses because they make excuses, such as the excuse that it's okay to feel uncomfortable in a trade. They think that, well, this is a part of the game. Oh, I'm down a hundred bucks. I feel like I want to get out because I'm down a hundred bucks, but whatever. That, that's probably just the trade. That's the way it's supposed to be. Fuck, now I'm down $300. Now I'm getting out because I don't want to lose any more money. Get out when you start to feel uncomfortable because something's not right in what you see. And then maybe you were wrong about it to get out, but at least you'll know you were wrong because you listen to yourself and you know, you'll start learning, hey, when should I listen to myself? When does that little voice in my head know what he's talking about? But if you never listen to your comfort level, you'll never learn what your little voice knows and what he doesn't know and needs to learn. Guys with the questions in chat, you know, I'm sorry, but I made it very clear that you had to submit questions ahead of time as I I put a lot of effort into preparing my answers and you know I won't be answering any questions that weren't submitted so I'm sorry all right moving on to level two the question is how do I use level two and I've got a lot of video examples here that I'm going to show you guys because it will make things easier because you will see action with your own eyes instead of me trying to explain things. So the clips I'm going to show will just be live trading clips of my own trading. Now before I show them, I will say a couple things on level two that you need to know. I use level two to determine when I should enter a position. It's especially important how level two reacts at round levels that end in fives or zeros, such as that 535 level I talked about on Google, that 1200 level I talked about on Priceline. Round levels really dictate trading, okay? Notice when Priceline lost 1200, it made a sick move lower. Notice a while ago when Netflix lost 400, on its daily chart right here it made a sick move lower and you know what if Netflix loses 300 it's gonna make a sick move lower so a lot of level two is you know identifying hey how is a stock reacting at round levels and it's the same way with penny stocks except penny stocks instead of every five and uh, five and ten points you know it's every penny or every 0.25. It still ends in a 0 or a 5, but you just break it down since you're dealing with much smaller numbers, such as 01, 0125, 015, 0175, 02, etc. And then once you get up to a nickel, then it starts going every penny, 5 cents, 6 cents, 7 cents, etc. If you're at a dollar, you can start doing every 5 and 10 cents again, $1, 105, 110. All right, so you want to see how is the price on level two responding to round levels when they get tested. Then what it comes down to is what is the stock having an easier time doing? If I'm going to go long a stock, it's because I see the stock displaying an ability to move higher with ease. If I'm going short a stock, it's because I see the stock displaying an ability on level two to move lower with ease. If I'm not going to trade a stock at all, it's because I see on the level two it's not really moving either direction. A big part of this displayed ability term that I'm using is how fast the level two is moving, right? Is the level two, if the level two is moving quickly, then it's more likely the stock is moving a certain direction easily. If the level two is moving slowly, then it's likely that the stock isn't having an easy time picking a direction to go. When a stock is moving higher with ease, you will see bids stacking and taking out asks quickly.
when a stock is moving lower with ease, you will see ask stacking and taking bids out quickly. When a stock isn't moving, you will see a constant battle between trying to take out bids and asks without a whole lot of net change. And I'm going to show you some examples of each setup here. These will all be setups on big board stocks since that's what I trade. I don't have any examples to cite in penny stocks because I don't have any footage of me trading a penny stock and using footage is the best way to show you an answer to this question. With that said, the same principles that you're going to see here from this big board level 2 movement can easily be the same stuff you look for in penny stocks and in my opinion it should be the same stuff you look for. So the first example I'm going to show you is from Thursday and these three examples coming up will be on Netflix stock. Can everybody see the level 2 of Netflix here clearly enough. I've got it pulled up right now. Okay, great. All right, so this will be an example of losing a round level. Remember I talked about how is the stock reacting at that round level. All right, so you're going to see Netflix testing 351, and the round level that I want you to observe the price action on is 350. I'm going to let it play out on its own, and then I'll make some comments. Okay, so I can talk over it and it doesn't sound. Okay, good, because I wasn't sure, so that's good to know. So, but observe how you lost 351 and now the asks are stacking below 351 here, okay? And we're coming up on 350. And let's see what happens at 350. What I want to see, do the bids start getting aggressive above 350? Nope, they get flushed out right away. And as soon as we lost 350, we broke lower right away, went right down to 349, and the asks stacked below 350. All right, now the asks are above 350, but notice the bids never come back above 350. Asks back below 350 right there. So we're getting commitment below 350. So in my head, in my head, I'm thinking, all right, Netflix just broke down just lost a round level at 350, the level 2 action just confirmed that there's a breakdown here. Look at the continued pressure. Now you're testing 347s. Okay, so you should have seen you lost 350, the asks flushed below it, couldn't regain 350, then we're printing 348. Great commitment there. Now, as a follow-up to this, so I said off of that action, I'm thinking short bias in my head, right? So now it's a matter of stalling out on any bounces in order to trigger a trade setup for me. So I will go forward by just a minute or so when Netflix had bounced off of a low a day in the 345s and was trying to get back up near 350, but you'll notice that it stalls out on 348s. As far as using level 2 to confirm this, uh, sorry, using time and sales to confirm this, yes, you know, I, you can see I've got my time and sales window right next to it and I also have primary time and sales posted on another screen 
that I have here that you guys aren't seeing right now. So yes, I do often use time and sales to confirm the move. All right, but so here we are. I'll play this and you'll see the low is 345 and you're going to try and get above 348. And what I want you guys to notice is how the bids never really build good pressure back above 348. And the asks end up stacking back beneath 348 and putting pressure back on the stock. Once it truly did lose 348, you'll see on this level two box here that I end up entering a position based on the fact that the level two was really stalling out on 348. So at this time, I'm right now I'm changing my order. Uh, sorry, changing the strike that I'm watching. I was watching the 345 put. Now I'm watching the 340 strike again because realistically, I think that's where Netflix can go. Okay, so here's this 348 test. Testing 348. Notice the asks are staying below 348. Notice the bids aren't really pressuring 348. And then watch what happens when it does try to get above 348. I just circled where you'll where you'll see my position and average price turn up after I enter a trade. You can see I enter my limit order here. And the reason I'm doing this is because of what I feel is a 348 stall from Netflix. It's not even going to get back up near 350. So I need to be aggressive here. So you have an ask at 348.15. Can they move it out? To, can they get 348.50s, 349 tests? You've got some bids here at 348, 348.04 bids. But look, right away they got whacked out. Okay, Another bid whacked out again at 348. Asks all the while have not really extended above 348.50. So there's still good ask pressure. Bids still below 348. Another bid, 348.20. Let's see, can it hold? Nope, whacked out right away. Asks still right down there near 348. Another bid line up at 348.29 this time. Let's see, do they get whacked out or do they start pushing? Up, oh, bids get whacked out again. Bids whacked out again, right back down near 347. That's confirmation to me of a 348 stall out. You can see I just entered my trade. I took a position off of that and now I'm in ready to go and you can see one final back test on 348 and you're about to see the stock roll over and print 346's in a couple of seconds I believe. Yes, I was the what I just bought wasn't out of the money put. And now here you are 346s. So now you're coming down. So now let's see all right, what happens at the low of day? Look how fast the asks are stacking. You know, we were just at 348. And right now, now we're testing 346s. Clearly to me, much easier time moving lower as opposed to higher. Stock's down 2%. Good speed, good velocity lower. And here's our low, 345.67.
All right, so we just lost 346. I'm staying with it as long as the ask pressure is remaining good, but I'm approaching 345. That's that's a level where I want to see a flush because I've got some profits. So if I'm not going to lock them in, I need to see the stock flushing below that round 345 level. That's a number that ends in a 5. Notice on that 346 test, we don't have any bidders being aggressive above 346. They're not pushing Netflix back up. Ask stacking below 346. Coming down to 345 even here. Trying to get the asks back above 346. All right, 346.14 asks. Can they clear them out, get back up near 347? Notice the bids. We don't have any 346 bidders, even though they got the asks back above 346. So there's still good pressure. You're not seeing bidders. All right, now we've got some bids. Let's see, do these bidders start pushing or do they get whacked out? Three forty six thirty bids, they're trying to push. But you see these bids getting whacked out. Now right back now there we go. Bids wiped out, three forty fives. So just I'm just trying to make the point how good the pressure is from the asks and how every time the bids try and stack, they're getting wiped out. That's what's keeping me in this short trade. Now we're printing 344s. You can see I'm in at 250. I end up selling at 370, I believe, on this continued move down. And that was really just a level two trade. Notice that I didn't reference the chart once. I never really mentioned anything about the three minute chart that I have here. It was all level two and time and sales based for that trade. All right, now final example from this trading day. I want you guys to remember what you saw happen at 350 and remember what you saw just happen at 345 when we flushed lower and now we're printing 342s. Remember that, okay? Now let's go forward here. Okay, what you're going to see now, Netflix is testing low a day again. This time low a day is 335, all right? And I want you guys to pay close attention to the 335 action. And let's just observe and let's see if we notice anything different about this 335 action as opposed to the 348, uh, 350 action or the 345 action that I just showed you guys. So our low is 335.01, okay? Testing 335 bids. All right, we're printing 335 bids. Let's see if we whack them out and flush, all right? Getting some 334s. Notice, though, that we're not flushing this time. 334.80 bids. We're not flushing. When you lost 350, you went straight to 348s. When you lost 345, you went straight to 343s. Notice this time, you lost 335, you're not going to 334. That tells me right away, this is bottoming price action potentially. I need to not be putting on any shorts, need to be very, care need to be very cautious. If I have profits that I haven't locked in, I have to be protecting principal because now the bids are popping back above 335. This is much different price action at low a day than the two previous round level tests that I showed you at 350 and 345. And right away, now you're testing 336s. The bids got good extension off of 335. Now let's see, can the asks come back down to 335? Nope, now they're taking out 336 asks. They're printing 336 bids. All right, they whacked out the bid, but let's see. Look at the bid side, guys. The bid fighting back up, 336 bids. They whacked them out again. Let's see. Do the bids come back above 336 or do the asks come back down below 335? What happens next? You can see the bids were able to regain 336. This should look like much different price action to you than the price action I showed you on the two previous examples. 
Here's another test, all right? So we whacked out 336 bids again, but look at the way they keep battling back. 335.80s, 335.90s, 336, 336.01. We're starting to get some speed from the bids. They're taking out the asks. This looks like a bounce. And here you are now testing 337. This ended up being Netflix's low a day overall. And you can look on the intraday chart from that price action. That is this action right here. That's this candle that you guys just saw. You just saw you just saw this whole move down, the example that I just showed you, and then that candle at the bottom. And look at the net result, guys. This thing ended up bouncing from 335 up to 344 and then further to 348. So I didn't use anything in the chart to identify that bottom. I only used level two to identify a bottom. And it's a good thing I did because if I was still trying to short there, I would have got my face ripped off. So Netflix provided some good examples there for us. Okay, I want to show you another example on level two. This will be from Wednesday. Okay, and what you're going to see in this example is you're going to see the opening price action. You're going to see Netflix open around 362, 363, and it's going to it's going to gap down and it's going to test lower, but it's going to hold 362. It's going to hold that round, just that number of 362. Sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to call it a round level because it's not a round level. It was just kind of the opening price, and it's going to be similar to the 335 action I just showed you. And then it's going to bounce, but then it's going to stall out, and I'm going to place a short trade, and you'll see. Again, this is all just level two trading, really. Level two and time and sales trading. Okay, so Netflix here has opened the low is 362 right now all right and just watch what happens it's going to wipe out these 363 bidders that it has right now and it's going to break to a new low a day but it's not going to flush it's going to hold 362 all right so you just broke to a new low a day you're testing 362 bids watch the asks they're trying to stack below 363 here comes that 362 test Notice, though, it lost low a day, and it only moved 50 cents lower. And now the asks are right underneath 363. You're not getting great ask pressure down near 362. Notice the asks back above 363 now. So you don't have great commitment from those asks. So these bids are trying to show you that it's holding 362. The bids are coming up now, getting some 363 bids now. So we're starting to push. So I'm thinking, all right, this thing's about to bounce. But the stock gap down, you know, it's down 2.5%. So I'm still thinking net bearish overall. I just don't want to short right here. All right, so bounced up, 364s. Now, on this day, my reference point was 364 to 366. So it's down 2.5%. And as it approaches 366, I want to start thinking about a short trade but I want to watch level two and determine, you know, is this going to be a good trade or not? So you can see I just placed an order. You'll see my position show up where I just circled. I'm shorting. Why am I getting in here? Why am I looking to short here? Because I'm near my reference point of 366. And now I can trade versus 366 stability. So now you're printing 366s. But let's start seeing what happens. Think about how easily it just pushed through 
362s and 363s, 364s, 365s. Now, is it able to push through 366s just as easily? That's what I want to see. You're getting some 366s. This ends up being a good battle here. Trying to get 367 prints. Watch what happens. So you got 367 prints. Watch these bids, though. Do they extend or do they get whacked out? The bids whacked out. Ask back at 367. Okay, more bids at 367. Do they extend and hold or do they get whacked out? Here's a push. 367.40s, boom, whacked out again right away. 367 bids, are they able to hold and extend again or do they get whacked out? Boom, 366s. Now we whacked out those bids again. Okay, ask back below 367. All right. More tests on 367. Let's keep watching those bids to see if they can ever hold 367, really push through and get beyond 366 to stop me out. You can see I'm in at 240. My bid is around 222. So, you know, if I stop out, I'm taking a 10% loss, which is a very small loss in options. A good entry point allows me to observe this level 2 action and kind of stick with it, let it play out. Think about how long it's spending in the 366s as opposed to the 363, 364s. It moved through those right away, but it's not moving through 366s as easily. So another 367 test. 367, 30 bids, boom, whacked out once again. You can see I've got a stop out order queued up, ready to stop myself out if it makes another push based on level 2. Ask back below 367, though. Bids only at 366.50. They're not getting as close to 367 as they were just a few moments ago. Ask back down, 366.50. Let's see if we come back below 366 here. Confirm this stall out. Now you're printing 365s. Now I feel good about the way it's moving. You can see now we're pressuring 365. Look how easily it went back down to 365 as opposed to you know, that struggle at 367. So let's see, now we're, the focus is on what now, guys? The round level. What's our round level here? Over under 365 action. So I want to see it, want to see the asks start stacking below 366 and then flush back below 365, get the asks back below 365 and wipe out bids in the 364s. And that's exactly what we get. Nice, awesome move. Look how quickly it just went down to those 364s. All right, now we're getting to ask stacking below 365, starting to pressure 364 even. Now we're printing 363s. And I exited that position at 370, I believe, on a new low a day. All right, so that was an example of, you know, the stock opening up. I watched to see how does it react at its low that it tested. It didn't flush at the low. I still want to be short, but I don't want to be short right there. Waited for a bounce. There's the bounce. It stalled out, started to stall out, got myself a good entry, and was able to make a good trade. Now, the final example is going to be level two action that I don't want to trade. So those were those were two directional moves. You know, that's good action. That's action that I'm trading. I'm looking to participate in. Now I'm going to show you action that I stay away from based on level two. This will be an example using Tesla. All right. So you're going to see Tesla is right around 207s, 208s. Market just opened. And I'm watching for fast pace action. I'm watching for bid stacking or ask stacking, you know, on the way up or on the way down. And what I want you to notice is how Tesla just kind of stays around 206s, 207s without really good speed in either direction. You don't have a swift move down. You don't have a swift move up. 
When you try to make a move down into the, into the 206s coming up right here, you'll see that the stock battles back and gets 207s and just doesn't show good commitment either way. All right, so here's that 206 test I just talked about. So, all right, so at this point I'm thinking, all right, maybe it's going to break down. Now it needs to break 206 and get some ask below 206 to get me interested in the short trade. Notice the asks, though, aren't being very aggressive, not nearly like Netflix was in the examples I just showed you. And the bids are coming back up. We're testing 207. All right, so now we're getting 207. So now I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe it's a long trade, actually, if it can start clearing 207s. So let's see. Notice, however, though, you're not getting 207 bids. You're just kind of hanging out in this range at a slow pace, going back and forth, up, down, up, down. Another 206 test. But then again, 206.90 bid, 207 test. You're just not getting good commitment to the downside, and you're not really pushing through 207s. You're printing 207s. Now let's see if you start getting 207 bidders. Nope. All right, so that's the type of action that is just kind of, hey, stay away. There's nothing really there going on. All right, so those are the examples with level two. And, but again, asking about level two is another one of those questions where I really need to work with you every day. So. Those examples were straight from my live trading with Watch Him Trade. So if, if that type of stuff interests you, if you got something out of that, I would recommend trying a five-day trial because that's the type of level two insight that I give every single day. As far as getting in on the orders you saw me placing, I usually uh, place bids. I usually try and fill on the bid, not the ask. All right, and a little lead into this, or a little additional insight, because this next question was somebody saying that they can never read support and resistance levels in level two, and sometimes both sides have the same amount of buyers and sellers, and then I get confused. So could I please touch on this further? Well, typically on level two, the size of the bids or the size of the asks will usually be bigger than one or the other. If the bids have more size, then there is more support on the bid side. If the ask has more size, then there is more resistance on the ask side. If they're about the same, then it's out of balance and just a matter of who blinks first. But you always have to pay attention, as I just showed in these examples, is which way is the stock seeming to have an easier time moving? Is there more activity of bids increasing and moving higher, which is bullish, or is there more activity of asks increasing and moving lower, which is bearish? If there's neither, then it's neutral, like on that last Tesla example, and I just really don't want to trade it. The other way to smooth out some of your reads with level two is to watch the tapes. Just watch time and sales. This is my time and sales window. I always have this pulled up, so you know this is good because it'll show you all the orders going through, and you can just quite simply read, all right, is there, are we moving up or are we moving down? And all you see is the prints going through, you don't see the level two action itself, but like how I have here, I've got my level two and time and sales next to each other on each of my six primary stocks. But again, the best way to really get familiar is to, is to watch it. All that commentary I just provided you guys, I didn't just wake up and understand it. I mean, that's years of studying level two religiously every day. That's, that's telling my friends I don't want to go get lunch with you on a Wednesday during class because I'm watching a stock trade instead, even though I'm not trading it. All right? That's telling my friends I'm not going out on a Friday night because I'm watching video footage of my trades so I can watch the level twos over again and see if I missed something or see if I reacted well. So you really need to put the time in 
to just study them, watch them and watch them and watch them, and you will become more familiar with them. Next question, how do I study charts for day trading? Similar to my last answer, I will say this. Look at charts, look at more charts, and then when you think you've looked at as many charts as you possibly can, look at even more. All right, And start to write things down off of all those charts based on what you think is going to happen the next day. Do that again and again and again on many different types of stocks and do this for months and you will get a better understanding of how to use charts for day trading because you'll see, hey, I was right. Hey, I was wrong. And you'll start to examine and you know, you'll become curious and the process will kind of in a way take care of itself, really. All right. Now, as for me personally, how I use them for two primary reasons when it comes to day trading. That is, number one, to identify key reference points, support or resistance, breakout, breakdown points, price targets or stop losses. Number two, to identify underlying trends in those stocks, or at least the potential of a or or the potential of a change in one of those underlying trends. And I just covered this in a watch him trade uh, webinar that was actually a free webinar. So. I'm going to reference you to the link I just posted in chat because I had a very similar question about this. And at the 3143 mark of the video I just linked in the chat, I expand on this topic further. And also in another video that I'm linking in the chat right now, at the 20 minute and 2 cent mark, I also address this topic further. although that link didn't work for some reason. Let me get, let me make sure I get the, the right link posted here. Okay, that one works. Both of those are free links that you should have no trouble accessing and the questions that I told you you want to review, they're time stamped, so you know, just watch that. I don't like repeating myself in multiple videos. If I have a video that answers the question, I'm just gonna refer you to that video. Next question deals with options, wanting me to explain implied volatility and open interest. So implied volatility, and I'll get a implied volatility mark pulled up here so we can get a visual for what we're discussing. Let's look at implied volatility for Netflix for this upcoming week. So you can see implied volatility is this category here. On the one side you've got puts, on the other side you've got calls. So what implied volatility is, is and I'm not giving the mathematical standard deviation, blah, blah, blah answer because that's not how I learned it and that's not how I know it. Um, but you can get, just a heads up, you can get very, very mathematical and technical with implied volatility. If you're an analytical type of person and you want that type of answer, if you just Google implied volatility, you'll find out all types of mathematical calculated calculus related stuff with it. I'm going to give the simple answer. Implied volatility shows you what the market's opinion is of a stock's potential to move. If implied volatility is high, then the market thinks the stock has the potential to make a big move. If implied volatility is low, then the market thinks the stock will not make a big move. If implied volatility is high, premium cost as a result will often be higher more expensive. If implied volatility is low, premium cost will often be lower or cheaper. And so what these percentages are telling you, and they 
move around a lot based on what the stock's doing is if the stock is going to be volatile or not. Implied volatility does not tell you, oh, the stock is likely to go higher or lower. Implied volatility simply tells you that the stock is likely to trade in a wide range. It's likely to experience volatility. So you look at Netflix, for instance, and you could see that implied volatility on these 300 strike puts, for example, are $1.90 implied volatility is 52% versus historical volatility of 44%. So implied volatility is higher than the historical volatility. So that's telling you that the market does think there is potential for Netflix to make a bigger than usual move here. And that makes sense given that Netflix just experienced a big move. The market is always going to think a big move is more likely when a big move has just occurred. Now let's look at Apple, for instance. Apple just made a big move overall, right? But, or sorry, Apple just made a big move the last two days. But overall, if you look at Apple, it really hasn't made a big move over the last few months. It's not above its high from, you know, a few months ago, and it was never below its low from a few months ago either. Apple's just kind of been in the channel. So based on that, would you think implied volatility on Apple is lower or higher than it will be on a stock like Netflix? Any guesses? Apple has not moved as much as Netflix in terms of volatility. So would Apple's volatility implied volatility exactly. So we've got to guess lower. I would agree. And you'll see Netflix, we just looked at implied volatility in the 40, 50 percentiles. If you look at Apple's implied volatility and it's around 20 percent, sometimes, you know, it's you've got some strikes that are not even 20 percent. So that tells you the market expects Apple to be less volatile than Netflix. And again, it makes sense. Netflix high-flying stock only in one sector, movie streaming. Apple is much more of a steadier stock, but also a less exciting stock. You know, Netflix was up 100% last year. Apple was not. All right. So implied volatility is just a measure for understanding what the market's potential behind a move is. And again, I stated that there is a lot of mathematics you could do to get more to get a better understanding of the percentage itself I don't have expertise in that field but I found a link that showed some good calculations that you would want in order to measure implied volatility exactly as for open interest open interest is the total number of contracts that are that have been opened at a certain strike so this number will include any contracts that were bought to open which is a long trade or sold to open which is a short trade presuming that neither the bought to open contracts have been sold to close so they've closed the long trades or the sold to open short trades have been bought to close, so they've closed the short trades. Basically, it's like a volume indicator of an option. If you have higher open interest at a particular strike, that means you've had more money come in and out of that particular strike. Just like if you've got higher volume on Apple on Thursday than you did on Wednesday, that simply tells you there is more activity there. All right, there's more liquidity. Now, open interest can play a big role in which way a stock moves because if open interest is huge at a particular strike, then you know there is a lot of money that came into that strike, be it on the long side or the short side. Sometimes 
you can see these strikes act as quote unquote magnets if they get approached if they approach going in the money that is traders who open positions on those strikes will take the stock a certain way to help build gains or hedge losses in the underlying strike so let's look at this here again and let's look at open interest Let's go with Netflix, since Netflix is volatile, more volatile than Apple. Well, actually, Netflix isn't a good example for this, because there's not a lot of major open interest anywhere. All right, Tesla's a good example for this, for what I'm talking about as far as magnets go. So these 200 strike calls have 1,600 contracts open, and they closed around six bucks. And on the put side, these 192.50 puts have. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not the 192.50s. The 195s have 1,100 contracts open, and they closed around four dollars. All right, so going to explain some things and then use these strikes to show certain scenarios. So again, this topic of magnets. If you have a lot of open interest at a particular strike and the stock is close to making that strike in the money with say, you know, 2 days left before expiration, then you might have traders that are holding open contracts in that strike buy up a bunch of stock in the market in an effort to add profits from being along the strike. Or if the strike goes in the money and lots of traders are short the strike, you might see them jump into the stock and also go along the stock in order to make money off of the stock itself to hedge against the losses they will have from being short the strike. All right, so let's talk hypothetically with these particular strikes. So you've got these 1195 puts, for instance, which have the most open interest of any strike close to the money. So say Tesla starts out below 200 on Monday and is just kind of hanging around 200, hanging around 200. The people who are in these 195 puts, they're going to want to make money off of those. So what they might do is they might start shorting the stock, selling the stock, borrowing shares to sell the stock in an effort to drive it lower to that 195 price because if they get closer to 195 and they can get their 195s in the money early on in the week they're going to make money off of premium increasing all right now let's take a different approach let's take the call side you've got pretty decent open interest of 1500 contracts at the 215 strike calls on Tesla, which closed at about a dollar and forty cents. Say the stock starts moving up on Monday, it gets up to 205, 206 right off the bat. These people holding 215s are starting to lick their chops. They're thinking, man, if I can get in the money by Wednesday, I'm gonna have some sick profits. So what they do is they go in to the market and they start buying the shit out of the stock in an effort to drive it even closer to 215. So that way other people who are holding the 215 strikes maybe will start doing the same thing. Or if people start initiating new positions on the 220 strike calls, they're going to want to push it to 220. So you see the 215 strike start to act as a magnet since that's where there's a good chunk of open interest. Now the reverse side of that is, yeah, it's kind of like a squeeze. That's exactly right. You, you get... Um, you can definitely get squeezes related to the option strikes based on the open interest. So that's a very simple terminology to use that applies in my opinion. All right, so the other side is what I would refer to as bag holder premium. Bag holder premium is large open interest on a strike that is now nearly worthless. Okay, and in that scenario, as that strike gets approached, you can see it actually act as support as the buyers of that strike 
look to get out at whatever pop they can in order to salvage losses. All right. So let's stick with this 215 example here. So they're around 140 going into Monday, right? Well, let's say Tesla opens up and all week just kind of stays between 205 and 210 or something. These 215s are going to lose value. Theta is going to kick in. Implied volatility is going to come down. Delta is going to move lower. All, all the factors are going to come together to move the premium price of these options lower. So anybody who bought them at 140, now by Friday, these are maybe going for 20, 30 cents. So they're sitting on major losses, right? Now on Friday, Tesla starts getting up towards 212, 213. These 215s are starting to get some premium back into them. But you have people that bought a lot of them around 140, as evidenced by the open interest to start the week. So those people, as the stock, as the strike is regaining some premium, they're going to look to salvage their losses. So they're going to be selling at 50 or 60 or 70 cents because now there's only a day left, they're not really optimistic it's pushing above 215. If you're selling 215 calls, you're selling the right to own stocks. So essentially anybody selling the 215 strike call is selling 100 shares of stock. 100, one option is equal to 100 shares of stock. So that's essentially creating a, another source of supply for the stock. So you could see the 215 strike act as resistance because you have bag holders in that strike that are looking to salvage losses. On the flip side, using the 195 put example, say Tesla stays above 200 all week, you know, between 200 and 203 or so, it's not very volatile, but these 195s lose, you know, 80% of their premium, they come back down to 50 cents because it becomes obvious the stock isn't going to 195 on the week. Now, on Friday, Tesla starts to trade lower. It breaks below 200. Okay, it's printing 199s. The premium maybe starts to come back a little bit in these 195 puts. They go from 50 cents to a dollar or a dollar 20 or so. The people that have losses are going to look to salvage losses, just like in the 215 example that I just mentioned. So they they are selling the right to be short Tesla. So they don't want to be shorted anymore and otherwise. So that is, in essence, creating support at 195. If you're selling the right to be short at 195, it's basically covering at 195. If you're covering at 195, you're essentially a buyer of the stock. You're helping create demand on the stock. So you could see 195 act as support due to the fact that Everybody who had 195 puts lost a good percentage of their premium throughout the week, and now it's the end of the week, and they just want to salvage something because they don't want it to expire worthless. And that is what I refer to as bag holder premium. Bag holder premium support. When a strike provides support because there are too many bag holders on it. And a good example, you know, probably came into play a little while ago. Check out these 150 puts, guys. These are going five cents by ten cents. Open interest: two thousand seven hundred, two thousand seventy-five contracts have been open. Those contracts did not get open at five to ten cents. I'm telling you that right now. So you have a lot of people who lost a lot of money by buying the 150 puts, you know, somewhere down the line. Now Tesla is not anywhere close to that, but if it was, that would be a scenario where you might see those act as support uh, as yeah, as support on the put side. Another example maybe here, the, the 220s are 1,500 con contracts open. Stock was down 4% on Friday, so you know they lost a ton of premium. They closed at 80 cents, so you already have a good amount of bag holders in those. Next question, and in advance, this is another kind of one of those open-ended questions that's tough to answer in a webinar type setting. But how do you increase your chances of buying a true breakout and decrease your chances of buying a fake out? Well, 
again, number one, it has to be it has to be it has to start with your prep work. You should have known what breakout you're looking for, and you should know what fake out characteristics you're looking for. Think about my Google example earlier, holding below 535 targets 530. If you start coming above 535, that's not legit. And one of the other comments I had made that you can see is Google hasn't been very volatile right here. There isn't great volatility. However, I would expect that to change on a 530 breakdown. All right, so in my mind, I knew there wasn't good volatility on Google, but I'm expecting that to change on a 530 breakdown. So this question talking about fake outs, 530 is a breakdown to me. If it's going to be a fake out, then Google should bounce back above 530 right away. It should come below 5, sorry, it should not come below 530 and then start printing 531s. That would be a fake out. It should come below 530 and commit. Start printing 529s. Start printing 528s. Show me commitment to that breakdown that I'm prepared for. Well, you look at Google and once you came below 530 here, you got back up to 530.99, never printed any 531s, okay, right here. And then this next two candles gave you a clean move beneath 530. And then after coming below it, it was done. It never got back up to 530. You know, it didn't give any of those fake out characteristics where if it's coming back above 530, then that looks like a fake out to me. So it starts with your prep work. It starts about it starts with knowing what you're watching for. Okay? And then with that said, what you're watching for shouldn't be a random number. It should be a number that has meaning okay technical meaning or fundamental meaning if you're measuring it that way I talked about 530 with Google why did I talk about 530 for the breakdown well it bounced off of 530 numerous times over the last few weeks so to me once it broke 530 there should be a good reaction there 1200 with Priceline why did I care about 1200 with Priceline well, it's a psychological level, one of those round levels I've discussed a couple times during this webinar. Okay, and if you notice, every time Priceline's been able to come above 1200, it's made a good move higher. Every time it's come below 1200, it's then made a good move lower. Okay, back above it, good move higher. So if you come back below 1200, I'm expecting another good move lower. That's exactly what you got. And that starts with my prep work, knowing the level that I'm watching, knowing what I'm expecting the price reaction to be once you get down there. After that, it just becomes a matter of seeing positive level two action confirming the breakdown or breakout if it's moving to the upside. If it's a fake out, it's going to look like that Tesla level two action that I showed you. It's going to come down, but the level two is not going to speed up. It's not going to get very aggressive to the downside or to the upside, okay? And it's going to roll back over. You think about that Netflix example I showed you when it held 362 and was bouncing to 366, his stock was moving higher. Inevitably, somebody got faked out into thinking Netflix was going to move higher beyond 365 once it got above it. What's the difference between the person who got faked out into the 365 breakout and the person like me who was shorting 366s? I felt that I was seeing level two stall out in the 366s. So level two is very important at your breakout and breakdown points. But before you can even get there, you have to know what those points are. Once you know what they are, then you really want to see level two. You want to see good speed. You want to see fast velocity. You want to see a lot of orders going through showing that you are correct in having identified that as a key level. If you get to a certain price and you move above it or below it, and then there's not a volatile reaction that follows, 
then clearly that level was only a key breakout point to you and not the market. You need your breakout and breakdown points to be confirmed by market volatility. If they are not, then you need to get better at your identification process. That wraps it up for the questions. So I have three chart requests now, but before I do those, are there any questions, anything that wasn't clear about everything I've discussed to this point? Again, I'm not taking new questions. The questions have to deal with stuff I've discussed or that you've seen already. How long does it take to become an expert in level two? Like I said, it, it depends on your commitment level. I, I, uh, I don't have a, I'm not big on the social scene, quite frankly. I, I do a lot of stuff on the weekend that I think helps me get ready. I, yesterday when the market closed, I was getting ready for Monday. I don't think there's a lot of people out there that on Friday, once their work is done, they're thinking about Monday's work day. And you know your prep with level two is the same way. Are you only learning level two when the market's open, or are you going on YouTube at eight o'clock at night trying to find level two footage so you can watch other trading and you can still see even more trading action go on? I've got a lot of YouTube videos that show live trading that'll show you level two that you can watch when the market's closed, or are you you know watching? the NBA playoffs at night instead because you know that's what you want to do. If that's what you want to do, if you find it relaxing, go ahead, but you're not going to become an expert as quickly. As far as a time frame, I mean a few years. I've been trading big boards for since 2011, so I, I don't think I'm an expert by any means, but I do think I'm pretty good at level two trading at this point, so I guess three years would be my answer. That's really how long it's taken me to get to this point of confidence. How does pre-market affect my reference points? Well, pre-market doesn't affect my reference points because I'm always adjusting my reference points. If I have a reference point going into the day, okay, for instance, a good example is Netflix. All right, so Netflix, my reference point was 370 after earnings because it closed that day around 373 and I felt like it was just kind of an over under 370 trade. However, you can see on this next day, after that earnings day, Netflix gapped down. I just circled it. So going into the day, my reference point was 370. But then pre-market, it's gapping down 362s, 363s. So I need to make a new reference point. My reference point then became around 365. That's kind of the round level. And that's actually the trade I showed you where I shorted 366s. So it doesn't, it doesn't affect reference points it just makes me you know hone in on a different one and then from there it's just a matter of observing price action at that new reference point and kind of coming up with a, a new trade but you know my outlooks in general I'd like to think do a good job of accounting for you know various gaps down or higher I'm always talking about what the you know, most important thing is, for instance, on Google going into Thursday, I had said, please stay below 540 because that's what keeps this setup clean. You know, so, you know, any reference point below 540 was still a net short on Google. I also made a comment in my prep that I'm most comfortable making trades above 550 on the long side. Okay, if it's, 
if I have a reference point on the long side, but it's not above 550, I'm not really comfortable there because that's kind of the level that I think Google needs on a net basis. As far as news, you know, affecting my strategy, I'm always going to see. I'm always going to see, you know, how the stock is reacting. So if there is news out, I'll just tell you right now. I don't ever look for news pre-market. I never scan news. I can never tell you why a stock is gapping up or gapping down unless it's on earnings. Then I just assume that hey, the market didn't like what the earnings report said. On this day, when Netflix gapped down somebody posted in chat that Amazon just signed a deal with HBO so I'm assuming that's why Netflix gapped down but you know I didn't I didn't go out of my way to say oh Netflix is gapping down I wonder what's going on it just I right, Netflix is gapping down let's go it's like just let's play ball let's make a good trade I don't really care why I only care what I'm gonna do about it When choosing my strike, I usually choose the one near my target based on my over-under approach. Yeah, I'd say that's true. You know, I'm always going to try and get a strike that's near my target. I'll answer watch him trade relevant questions at the end. Any other questions, guys? I'll address, like I said, I'll address those nine to fivers. I'll have some remarks on that at the end. All right, so I'm going to do the chart requests now. First one was TDEY. Okay, don't really like this. I, I'm not a big fan of sub pennies. Um. Just not a lot here, quite frankly. I mean, you're channeling between double zero one and double zero one five. So TDY needs to get above double zero one five to set up a test of double zero two. Key resistance is this high from the past week, double zero two two. If you can hold double zero fifteen, then you can test double zero two to double zero twenty two. And if you can break out there, then that could get things going better towards double zero three to double zero four. Otherwise though I would just kind of expect TDEY to drift back down towards the triple zeros. I would not be interested in this trade at all while below double zero fifteen. The only thing that gets me interested is if the if it can make a push above double zero fifteen and then I'd look to trade it versus that level. But in general I think there's a lot better stocks out there than this one traded sixty five million shares on Mon on uh, Friday, so on a double zero one stock, I mean you're talking sixty five thousand dollars in liquidity. That's pretty shitty. I would look for more liquid plays, even though the penny market is slow right now, guys. There's still li better liquidity elsewhere. You always want to try and find good liquidity. Next chart request was ERBB. This is one that, you know, this is the one that if I was playing penny stocks, even though it's in a downtrend, I'd still be watching this one because, hey, this traded, this is still trading over, you know, a couple million dollars a day, all right? So the volume is still really good. I know I can get in and out. ERBB is interesting because if you look, you're back testing some previous resistance levels. You you're right around four cents. You rallied in at the beginning of the year from a penny up to four cents, and then you pulled back to two cents. But then, once you were able to push above four cents, you made a much nicer move higher. Okay, and now you've come back down to this same four cent area. So I actually like the long side on ERBB if it can stabilize at or around four cents. I would give it a shot and you know stay with it as long as it's you know not down more than a couple tenths of a percent from four cents but you could get in at four cents and you know put a stop at at three and a half cents and you know 
if you get stopped out, you're taking a 12%, 12 to 15% loss. But if you're able to bounce and get back up, you know, towards this six cent area, which is where you stalled out on the last bounce attempt, you're talking about a percentage return of 50%. So I like the risk and reward on on uh, ERBB. Ultimately, though, you know, it comes down to what I said about the marijuana stocks earlier in the webinar, that they're in a cold spell right now. So, you know, you don't want to get an ERBB and expect it to go up to 11 cents. If it gets back up to 5, 6 cents, you want to take profits because the market is, is crappy right now for these. All right. And until that changes, you want to take smaller gains. You're not getting a move from two cents to ten cents like you did in March. That's just not going to happen until the marijuana sector finds its footing and all these stocks start bouncing again and start getting some life back into them. Last chart request I received was for Apple. So Apple here is testing a key level and that is its 52 week high around 575. Apple is a simple over under 570 setup right now. As long as Apple is holding 570 then it is going to go higher and it's going to break out above 575 and challenge 580 to 600. If Apple is not able to hold 570, key support is the earnings day low right around 560. You lose five, you lose 560, and it opens up this wide gap range, you know, really between 560 and 530. So Apple is a nice simple setup here. It's definitely one that my guys have had their eyes on in the options, and I'll be watching this week. Just like I said, over under 570. Anything above 570 is bullish on Apple and targets a test of the 52-week high at 575 with a breakout there targeting 580s. Key support, earnings day low of 560. The other reference point support is the earnings day close of 567.77. And that was it for the chart requests. Okay, so a couple things I'm seeing in the chat. You don't need to worry about being a mathematician at all. But what you do need to know is you need to be able to calculate your percentage loss you know, on the fly pretty quickly when it comes to stopping yourself out. What I mean by that is, so this Apple 580 call that I'm watching at $2.50 here, right? You need to know that 10% of $2.50 is $0.25. Cents. So that way, if you buy at $2.50 and it goes down to $2.25, you know you're at a 10% loss, okay? You can't you can't be in a situation where the stock goes down 30% and or your position goes down 30% and you don't realize it because you're bad at math. But it's really easy. If you ever want to figure out what 10% of the number is, just move the decimal point over one spot to the left and you'll get your percentage. You'll get your 10% mark. So for instance, Amazon, I'm looking at the 295 puts going into this week. If I buy at 320, move the decimal over one spot. I know that 32 cents is 10% of 320. So as soon as I get down to 290, I'm down 10%. I need to be aware of that. So you need the basic skills, being able to figure out your 10% loss threshold, and you know being able to then subtract that number from the price you bought in at. Is that definitely is important because you want to be able to keep track of your losses and your gains as well. Uh, as far so as far as watch and trade and guys who have nine to fives, it depends on your nine to five. I mean, I, I've got a lot of I shouldn't say a lot, but definitely a handful of people that have nine to fives, but they're able to access the go to webinar 
and they're able to see my platform during the market hours so they still get a lot out of being members because they're sitting in their cubicle and you know the, their boss isn't making sure they're doing something they're able to hide the screen you know they can get away with it basically what I'm is what I'm saying um, so if you're in that category then you know nine to five won't restrict you if you're nine to five you know and you're not behind a computer then it will restrict you as far as tra that's as far as trading if you're trying to you know trade with me if you're just trying to learn everything is recorded all of the examples I showed you guys were you know a few minute clips of hours worth of video just this week alone there's over 10 hours worth of live trading footage for you to be able to go back and review for yourself where I'm constantly you know in teaching and trading mode just like I was here um, so everything is recorded and, and you can review it but most people like you know most people sign up at least to me it seems most people sign up because they want the live trading not simply just the recorded footage but it is available for that person um, so Harmon made a comment about being a member not guaranteeing profits. Yeah, I mean, obviously my disclaimer goes out of its way to say that there's no guarantee with profits, as any financial service will say. Um, what I will say is that I'm, I'd like to consider myself consistently profitable. And, you know, you guys saw some of the trades I made just from the examples. And, you know, I call out those trades as I'm making them before I'm making them so and I talk about it too because you're seeing my prep work you know what I'm looking for I go over all my setups pre-market so you know if a certain setup shows up it's pretty easy for you to be able to make the same type of trade as me and if it's profitable for me it'll be profitable for you assuming that you're getting in near the same price or at the same price as me which is pretty easy with options really that is one of the major advantages with options over penny stocks is that the liquidity and the ability to get filled right away. I know sometimes a penny stock alert comes out and you're rushing to get in and you can't get filled. It really doesn't happen that way on options. I, I also strongly encourage you guys, you know, I posted the links in chat but watch the webinars, the free webinars from Watch Him Trade that I linked in because I do a Watch Him Trade webinar each week for subscribers and it's similar to this um, in that you know subscribers submit their questions and they submit their charts and then it's free in that I post the content afterwards so you have to be a subscriber to submit a question and attend the live session but I post the content for free afterwards for learning purposes so I'd encourage you guys to click on those two links and you know if you have some time today watch those videos in full as there's just more education there anything else guys uh, the trade station how much do I pay for data, um, I pay eighty dollars for various data. It would be another hundred dollars for the platform, but I have a. Uh, if you make more than fifty trades in a month, you get the platform fee waived. I do make more than fifty trades in a month, so I get that platform fee waived. Also, with TradeStation, if you're a Watch Him Trade member and you have a TradeStation account, you get twenty percent of your commissions back at the end of each month. You just get them credited back to you in an account, and that can help pay for the fees themselves. Um, if you use E-Trade Pro, I actually got fed up with E-Trade and moved to TradeStation, but that was because I'm trading options. If you're looking to trade options, then E-Trade Pro is going to fuck you over at some point. It's just a matter of time. So if you're only trading penny stocks 
then E-Trade will be fine for you. Um, but if you're looking to trade options, you've got to find a different broker because I don't even want to. Uh, there's just horror stories. Yeah, TLS, Thinkorswim would be a good one. I mean, somebody even just commented in chat, they got fucked on Friday by E-Trade. So that's, that's just not good that I'm able to say E-Trade sucks in options and somebody right away is able to be like, yep, I'll raise my hand. I just got screwed. I have no experience with NinjaTrader or MetaTrader. And again, I, I really don't want to unless it's related to something we've discussed or people want more insight and watch him trade. I don't want to do anybody wrong and answer somebody's question but not somebody else's. But yeah, never don't have any experience with them. I, I've got experience with TradeStation for about a month and I am extremely satisfied with them. And again, guys, if you know if you have uh, if you've liked what you've seen here, you know, and you want more of the level two stuff, um, you know, definitely look into taking a five-day trial on Watch and Trade. I'm not going to turn this into a commercial for watch him trade but I think five dollars for five days is a pretty good deal no risk to you other than that five dollars you spend and if you like it you stay on board at 130 a month if you don't simply cancel within those five days and you're gone so but you get a lot of the questions you know if you want to ask me questions all the time without me saying oh I'm not going to answer that you know sign up there and you'll see that there's definitely a lot more interaction in there. The only reason I'm, I'm not answering other questions here is because I spent a few hours preparing my remarks and picking the clips I wanted to show and finding the links online I wanted to share and everything so I don't want to answer things off the top of my head. Uh, Okay, Sam, I'll post those in here right now. The chat room, give me one sec. I, I've posted the links in the uh, Stockhaven chat room, but I'll post them in uh, here. Just give me one sec. Thanks, guys, for attending, and thanks for the questions. Good participation, and hope you guys got something out of this and if you have further questions you can get in touch with me at info at stockhaven.com as for the person on GoToWebinar waiting for me to post those links just give me one sec All right, there's the two links. You should have gotten them. All right, thanks, guys. Again, this was recorded. It'll be uh, posted by the end of this weekend. Have a good night. I'll see you Monday.